Hi everyone. This video is a book review about a book that I recently borrowed from the library about a week ago. And the title of this book is The Financial Recovery Workbook, a step-by-step -step plan for regaining control of your money and your life during and after a personal financial crisis. And it was written by Michelle Kagan, CPA, and she's the author of Investing 101. Now, April is Financial Literacy Month, but this is not the reason that I decided to borrow this book. I decided to borrow this book because I am going to spend the rest of the year really diving into focusing on my finances. Now, I have already been doing this for about a year or so with the help of my handy dandy budget binder. I've been saving a lot of money. I've been paying a lot of bills. This isn't my only binder. I actually have like maybe, I don't know how many binders I have. I think I have seven. I have two pink, two silver, a blue, um, a hot pink, a purple, <laughs> clear, blue. I have like nine of them. And each of these binders has helped me save for my goals. It's helped me pay my bills. It's helped me pay my bills ahead of time. But I want to stay motivated. I want to have a better understanding of money. So I have decided to search for more books that will help me with my financial literacy, books that are more updated because the books in my collection are somewhat out of date. If you are a person that goes to the library a lot and your library uses the Dewey Decimal System, then you will want to check in section 332 in the adult section, which is for money or in the children's section. Now, this book is essentially a financial recovery workbook, and its specific focus is on if you are in a financial crisis. It shows you step by step how to navigate through this crisis and how to eventually get out of this crisis. It doesn't have any fluff. She doesn't hide anything. It's a very real book for real people. And that is why I enjoyed reading it. Some of the um, terminology in the book I didn't understand because I am just not that financially savvy when it comes to investing and different things like retirement accounts. All I know is saving and budgeting. That's really all I know. I don't know about 401ks. I don't know about IRAs. But she talks about that in her book. So before I get into what I learned from this book, let me tell you a little bit about the author. Michelle Kagan, and if I'm pronouncing her name incorrectly, I sincerely apologize. I will just call her Michelle, or the author. Michelle Kagan is a CPA, author, and financial mentor. She has written numerous articles and books about personal finance, investing, and accounting, including the infographic guide to personal finance, debt 101, investing 101, stock market 101, and financial words you should know. Get more financial guidance from Michelle by visiting michellekagancpa.com. So I went and checked out the author's website and I really liked it. She had she has a page where she talks about the financial services and other services that she offers. She offers business coaching. She offers personal coaching. She also has books that she's selling. Um, I don't know how many books that she's written, but one of them is on budgeting. One of them is on investing and um, just other books related to finances. She also has a blog. This is a picture of her. Um, if you can see it, I'll post it in this video. So you really can't see it. On her website, it says, Michelle Kagan focuses on helping women take control of their personal and business finances, overcome financial anxiety, and achieve lasting financial peace of mind while building sustainable wealth. 
Now, I was drawn to this book because I feel like I am going through a financial crisis. Um, I feel like I've been going through a financial crisis since the moment I stepped out of college or possibly in college. I might have been in one before college. Who knows? But this was when I got my own money. So essentially since 2008, I've been in a financial crisis. And I think she focuses on women because according to a lot of authors, women and men, we we handle money in different ways. Usually a lot of the time, some women are the sole providers of their families and they're just like, they might make less money than men or they're working multiple jobs. It's, it's pretty interesting. So a lot of the financial books that I have been reading as of late are targeting women and focusing on the needs that they have for their life and their finances. This book is relatively new. It was published in 2021 by Simon & Schuster. It was Adams Media, which is an imprint of Simon and Schuster. It's dedicated to somebody named Jenny, who helped her through the hardest times. This book is divided into six chapters. And chapter one is facing the fears and finding the facts. Chapter two, beginning with your starting point. Chapter three, creating a plan to move through the crisis. Chapter 4, Finding Ways to Bring in or Free Up More Money. Chapter 5, Reducing Money Going Out. And Chapter 6, Getting Back on Track and Fortifying Your Finances. And then she has a conclusion and resources in the back of the book. I may include some of the resources that she listed in the back of the book, like some of the recommendations and stuff, and put it in the description box or the comments. This book is part book and part workbook, of course. You can get some of her worksheets that she's incorporated into the book on her website, I believe, or you can just get the actual book and work on it yourself within the book. So we're going to start off with chapter one, which is facing the fears and finding the facts. And... As I was reading this book, I had to pause a lot because I had a couple of just realizations. And I'll tell you as I go along. I also had flashbacks of different financial issues that I've had in the past as well. It says, you've been hit by a crisis that put you in a difficult financial position. And you may be afraid that you'll never be able to get back to a secure place or make financial or future financial progress. That fear can be overwhelming and it may lead to other negative emotions like guilt, shame, and self-doubt. The only way to fight those fears is to name them and face them. And in the following chapter, you'll do just that. You'll use the financial fears inventory worksheet to identify the fears that may be sabotaging you. Once you've named those fears, you can begin to diffuse them and move forward from them. You'll also discover some of the financial circumstances that are unique to your crisis, along with targeted tips to help you work through them. I think that this beginning part of the chapter is very important because sometimes people will dig themselves more into a financial hole because they're in denial. They're in denial that they have a gambling problem. They're in denial that they're not making enough money or that they're being a spendthrift. They're just in denial. If they sat there and admitted what was happening, that would be more of a step towards progress than just staying in denial. I mentioned, I don't know if I've mentioned this in another video, one of the YouTubers that I like to watch, and I don't watch that many YouTubers, but one of the YouTubers I like to watch is Caleb Hammer. And he has a channel called, it's called Caleb Ham Hammer, but his show is called Financial Audit, I believe. 
and he interviews people from all different backgrounds. I think he may be based in Austin, Texas, because a lot of the interviewers I've seen in his videos are in Austin. But these people have debts. They have just all of this reckless spending. Some of them ended up in a financial crisis just due to life, and others just created a financial crisis for themselves. And <laughs> what's really interesting is seeing some of them, some of their faces when they have to face reality. When he reads to them how they spent their money, and it's just like they just go, it's like they just shrink <laughs> in their chair or they start laughing. But it's great because they've placed themselves in a vulnerable position. And once they face that fear, they know how to move forward. Now you've publicly, I guess, humiliated yourself or humbled yourself. And now you can start fresh. And talking to these people actually helps the viewer to not feel so bad about what they're going through and also to get motivated to do better. In fact, watching his videos has helped me to become more motivated to um, really go hard in, I guess, increasing my finances and all sorts of things. Except that emergencies and major life changes affect finances. A lot of situations can take a temporary toll on your finances, and most of us have to deal with one or more of these at some point in life. Along with your regular expenses, your crisis will create its own extra costs and consume resources you are counting on to cover things. So let's go through some of the crises that you may face, be facing right now or may have faced in the past. So the first crisis is a health crisis. I think that's one of the worst things you can ever go through because when you're in a health crisis, that's a whole nother layer of worry. You have medical bills. You, It might not even be your own health crisis. It might be another person's health crisis that still financially impacts you. So I had a health crisis in 2017. I was bedridden for basically a month. And that was the only time in my life I thought I was going to die. And my body actually has not been the same since. I mean, I'm okay, but I could be better. And I attribute that to what I went through in that year. But that financial crisis or that health crisis led to other health crises that ended up costing me money, medical bills and other things that dug me deeper into debt. And it says, we usually don't expect health emergencies, but they have to be dealt with no matter how they'll affect your finances. When you're dealing with broken bones, a cancer diagnosis, or mental health struggles, for example, you can't skimp on care. Health situations add an extra level of financial frustration because it can be difficult to know how much they'll cost you until after the fact. You'll have to coordinate insurance, submit claims, and possibly negotiate with care providers to stay on top of these expenses. When you've experienced a health crisis, you may be unable to work, which is what happened to me. When someone you love is suffering, you may have to devote a lot of time to their caretaking. It's important to create a plan with manageable steps to deal with the financial piece. Divorce. I've never been married, um, so I, I can't be going through a divorce, but I did have relationships that messed me up financially. I'm just going to, even though it says divorce, I'm, I'm just going to include this, like, the romantic relationships I had and the friendships I had. Some of the friendships I had actually ended up costing me a lot of money. Some of the divorce from my community has cost me a lot of money. I could have saved so much money. I could have saved so much money and so much time if I had not invested in my community work. My teacher told me it was a waste of time 
and I didn't listen to her. And I truly regret that because I did take a lot of financial hits just from dealing with my community. So divorce, I could see that as the same thing. When it's a divorce, you have properties you may have to split. There might be children involved. It's a very emotional toll. It can also be a very dangerous situation, especially if you're like, in an abusive relationship, sometimes people don't make it out of divorces alive. They might, you know, something might happen. I don't know, violence. But it says, sometimes a person know a divorce is coming and other times they are blindsided by it. Even in the best of circumstances, both partners typically face immediate financial setbacks and higher expenses. Your income to expense ratio will change dramatically with expenses eating up a larger portion of the money you have coming in. That's why some people don't divorce. They just separate because it's like it's cheaper to keep her, they think. And they'll just have their own like boyfriend or girlfriend on the side, but still be married because it's just it's just too much. It's too expensive to get a divorce. So sometimes that happens. Death. When you lose someone important in your life, finances may be the last thing you want to deal with. But during this time, a lot of money-related issues will need to be untangled, and that includes figuring out how to cope financially. Your financial situation will depend partly on whether you receive life insurance proceeds or other death benefits. Organizing your finances after a death can be especially tricky if you lost a partner who took care of the lion's share of them. Oh my goodness. This chapter, this section of the chapter really made me have a flashback because like I, I've mentioned in other videos, I'm an only child, my mother's only child, and I was my father's only child. And it hit me that my father died in poverty. Like he never made it out of poverty. He literally... He could have lived longer if he hadn't been in poverty. But because of his financial situation, it shaved at least 20 or 30 years off of life that he could have had, if that makes any sense. Just the stress, the struggle, the street life basically cut his life short. And near the end of his life, he was actually trying to get his finances in order. He was trying to figure out what to do to have everything secured. But I didn't know that because we didn't have each other's, we weren't communicating. I didn't know how to reach him. I was trying to reach him through other people. And when he died, he basically had nothing. He had nothing left. He had no life insurance. He had nothing to pass down to his child, which is me. I'm not saying like, oh, I just wish he had given me something. But if I had a child, I'd want to pass something down to them. If it hadn't been for my aunt's pain for his funeral and the cremation, I literally don't know what I would have done. Because I did not have the money at the time. I just was struggling. So thank God I had them. So if you are a person that has a family, I would highly suggest life insurance or something of that nature, just to ease the burden. There is a book called, um, oh my goodness, I want to say it's called Grieving God's Way or I, I don't, I don't know what it's called. There's two books and it's by local author Lydia Douglas. And she one book is how to get through grief and the other book is like preparing for the end of your life, like all of the papers that you need and everything. So I'm going to put that book in the link below and you can check her out too. Job loss. Losing a job, especially if you're the primary earner in your household, can cause a sudden financial shock. I've had that. I actually lost an apartment, not because of a job loss, but because my job didn't pay me on time. Not this job, but my other job. It didn't pay me on time. 
three times in a row. So I ended up losing an apartment. Um, it was very stressful. It was very hard. It took me a while to get back to normal, but it's it still wasn't as secure as it was before. Market crash close to or after retirement. Me, me I don't know this. I don't have a portfolio. I'm not in... Like I said, I'm just learning how to be financially savvy, so I don't have like investments right now. I'm still trying to get the basics down. But I could see how that could be a very terrible situation for people. Natural disaster. From hurricanes to wildfires to earthquakes, natural disasters seem to be coming harder and faster every year. I haven't experienced a financial disaster, thank, thank God, but some people have. You had like Hurricane Katrina, you have tornadoes, you have floods, and the best thing I can think of is like making sure everything is prepared, like insurance. Any of these can leave you with substantial damage to your home and or belongings. So understand the financial fallout from a crisis. These include extra expenses generated by the emergency, burning through your emergency savings, increased use of credit cards, watching your credit store drop, and all sorts of financial disasters. The next part, she talks about recognizing your financial fears. Common financial fears that I've experienced, many of these myself, include being afraid that you'll lose everything. You'll lose your home end up homeless. You won't be able to manage. You'll let your family and yourself down. You'll make the situation worse. You'll go bankrupt and you won't be able to retire or stop working. You may recognize some of the financial fears listed here or yours may be totally different. So you have to face and accept your situation and change it. The only way to get through your financial crisis is to face it head on. You can't begin to repair your finances until you've acknowledged and accepted the situation you're in. I know that's hard to do. In a weird way, accepting that things are this bad can feel like accepting failure. But it's actually the opposite. And she's right. The more you stay in denial, the more time you spend not making any progress because you're in denial. If you're in denial, you're just going to keep spending and spending and losing money and ending up in a deeper, worse situation. But if you face the music, you're getting somewhere. In this worksheet, she wants you to write down your financial fears. It's just a line, a little journal. Financial fear examples and an inventory. This worksheet can help you identify the fears you have surrounding your financial struggle. Don't filter yourself here. Being honest about your fears is the first step towards conquering them. So, financial fear examples. I'm afraid that I'll make the wrong money move. And how you can alleviate this is by saying, if that happens, I will figure out how to fix it and I'll know how to handle it in the future. Another fear. I'm afraid of losing my home. And the um, solution is, there are steps I can take to prevent that, but if it happens, I will find a new place to live. So what are my financial fears? I've had some in the past and I have some right now. Um, one of my financial fears, which I didn't realize until I read this book, is I'll die in poverty like my father. Like I'll never get out of poverty. That's my financial fear. That my biggest financial fear. It supersedes every financial fear I have. I don't want to die in poverty with nothing. I don't want to die in poverty. That's my biggest one. The umbrella. And how can I alleviate that? Is by saying... I can take the steps now where I won't have to end up in poverty. 
I can start saving money. I can start acquiring properties and lands and all sorts of different things. I don't have to end up in poverty if I don't want to. If I work hard now, figure out different ways to form a little nest egg for me and my family, then I'll be good. I'll be good. Another financial fear is like, oh, I'll never get a house. I mean, I don't know the first step to buying a house, but how I alleviate that is learn about buying a house. Talk to people who've successfully successfully bought a house. Um, just take start saving money. Take a step-by-step course to getting what I need. I'm afraid I'll never get out of debt. Well, that's silly. All I have to do is pay it down. Start off with the smallest debt, then move on to the next debt and move on to the next debt. I've already paid off like two debts already. So what's the difference? You got to look at it like that. You have to realize that it's all a game and you are the winner. You have to move forward in order to play this game. You can press pause, but pause is actually like you're losing. So do something about it. Do anything. Pay it. Form a plan. Set a schedule. That's how you can do it. And then it says separate feelings, thoughts, facts, and actions. So the feelings. For example, fear, anxiety about the future. Thoughts. I can't afford to get my son the care he needs. We're going to have to sell everything and I'll never be able to retire. Facts. My son needs to be in the hospital for three weeks and that will cost between $15,000 and $20,000. Actions. I can contact my insurance company to find out my expected share of costs. I can call the hospital to work out a payment plan. I can take money out of savings and retirement savings to pay these bills. Beginning with your starting point, that's chapter two. It says, gather all of your financial facts. When your situation is filled with uncertainty, you need to start with the facts. You may be worried that it's too overwhelming to look at your big picture finances during a crisis, but it will actually give you a sense of control and comfort. So she has like four steps. One, crisis specific costs. And it says, the first thing you'll need to do is pinpoint the specific expenses directly tied to your crisis situation. So for example, your crisis situation might be, you owe this amount of money for this rent, this back payment rent. So that's your specific. You pay that specific amount plus extra because you might accrue, accrue fees. The ongoing crisis cost worksheet at the end of the chapter will help you think of every cost you could be facing until your situation gets resolved. So when you do this worksheet and see all of the costs, that should take some of the panic out of your mind because now you see it on paper. It's in numerical form. It might make you panic, but now you're starting towards a solution. It's like, okay, I owe $500. I divide it into this many weeks and I pay this and I pay that and I pay that. And over the course of time, you'll get it. Step two, cash flow. You'll need to know your cash flow. To get a good sense of timing, you'll list out your income and expenses by the week. This worksheet is not the same as a budget. It might show more and more money going out than coming in. On the incoming portion of this worksheet, you'll include only money that you're guaranteed to receive. Then, step three, network and net worth. After you've got a good handle on your current cash flow, you'll want to use the Know Your Net Worth worksheet at the end of the chapter. To take a look at your net worth, a snapshot of where you stand right now, financially speaking. Then for debt table, and you essentially take a look at all the debts. Oh, here's some of the worksheets that she has.
This one is Chapter Worksheets, Ongoing Crisis Class. Current cash flow, debt table. I actually have something like this. I made a worksheet of my own um, to show how many debts I had. And whenever I paid off, made a payment, I would write it in there just to keep track. The date and the um, reference number. Chapter 3. And I'm just going to focus on this last, this last chapter. So I won't get too, you know, too long. Chapter three is creating a plan to move through the crisis. Rethink the rules. General personal finance rules typically include pretty standard advice. One. Build up emergency savings. Two, max out retirement account contributions. Three, aggressively pay down debt. And four, spend less than you earn. I mean, I've seen that in a lot of other financial books as well. But she says, that's good advice typically, but not when you're in the middle of a financial crisis. And I actually like that. I like that she's keeping it real. She realizes that you're in a bad situation. She's not trying to make you go extremely extreme, but she's not trying to coddle you either. She's trying to get you through this crisis where you're at the least amount of panic that you have. When you're in a state of panic, you cannot think clearly. As you move through the crisis, your overall finances may take a hit. That's to be expected, and it's okay. You may run through your savings. You may have to sell off investments. Your debt load may increase. Remember, all of these are temporary and necessary losses. Your longer-term financial goals will, goals will be put on pause, but they won't disappear if you go into this with a solid plan. So, these are the rules she has for navigating through this crisis. Preserve cash at all costs. Stop saving for retirement or long-term goals. Stop paying down debt above, above minimum payments. Negotiate to lower or pause debt payments whenever possible. Keep your credit cards active, even if you don't need them yet, to avoid cancellation or limit reduction. Apply for increased credit limits, or additional credit cards, usually 0% interest cards. And if you have trouble with that, you can always hire like a CPA or a financial coach to help you navigate through it. She goes into the types of losses that you go through, like physical losses, which are um, property from natural disasters, paper losses, where you're just losing like money. Then you have to refocus your goals. Your new goals are cover essential expenses, cover non-critical needs, avoid tapping into retirement funds, and avoid taking on debt. You create a bare bones budget. And essentially a bare bones budget is like you're focusing on your your primary needs and I like this chapter because she really lays it out like how you do it she ranks all of your expenses by the most important to the least important so like rank number one would be your mortgage or rent food utilities medicine and immediate need medical care and transportation and the lowest rank is like memberships you don't use streaming services household help all that and once again you repeat what we repeated in one of the former chapters which was what are your cash resources what assets can you use And at the end of each chapter, there is, of course, a worksheet. There's a worksheet. Mm -hmm. 
this worksheet right here is um, expenses you only pay occasionally. Enter the amount due in the applicable months. So there's like auto insurance, car registration, driver's license renewal, and all that. Then she has finding ways to bring in more money or free up money. That's in chapter four. And I like these because they're just very simple. You can look in your pockets. You can sell money online. Selling ad space on your car through apps like Carvertise, Rapify, or Sticker Ride. Selling old clothes your kids outgrew through ThreadUp or Poshmark. Checking old birthday cards. I'm not going to go into the IRA because she goes into detail about like IRAs and bankruptcy, and I learned so much about bankruptcy that I didn't know. I, I was like, whoa, that's intense. That's really intense. I didn't know it stayed on your credit uh, credit report like for seven years. I, I didn't know that. I never filed for bankruptcy, for real. But I could understand how um, overwhelming it can be for some people. Consider work options, overtime, multiple jobs. She also lists some side gigs. DoorDash and Postmates, that's like food delivery. Lyft or Uber, that's like rideshare. Helping people move with Dolly. Chores and handyman stuff. Task Rabbit, Thumbtack or Handy. Dog walking and sitting with Rover, Wag or Fetch or babysitting apps like Care.com, Urban Sitter, or Bambino. And she also even has a skills inventory sheet, worksheet. Like what skills do you have? What can you make money off of? So yeah, I think, I think this is a nice solid book. How to move through these crises without destroying your whole financial world. She speaks in a calming tone throughout the entire book. Anytime I felt like I was panicking, I just felt secure in her tone, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Because I swear when I was reading, I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And she would give me the answer. She'd be like, if you do this, because she'll also list the consequences of if you do something unconventional. She's like, if you do this, this will help, but you also have to do that. So what helped you will not hurt you. I'm like, okay, okay, that makes sense. All right. If this happens, do this and keep it that way for such and such amount of months. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, it was like, it was like talking to somebody just keeping it real with you in a professional way. And that's why I really liked this book. I'm actually thinking about buying this book 
just to have it on hand. Because I really don't, I almost don't want to give it back to the library. But just like, you know what, I need you in my collection so I can memorize this and help other people through um, going through their financial crises, like incorporate it and practice it in my life and see if it can help them as well. Some books to just share with customers. But yeah, that is all I have to share with you. I give this book a I don't have any awards yet. I need to make up one. I give this a thumbs up. But I'm pretty sure I'm going to do a award. Like a one through five star elephant. The Financial Recovery Workbook. A step-by-step -step plan for regaining control of your money and your life during and after a personal financial crisis so be sure to check out her website and if you want I guess pay for her services and different things so thank you for watching everyone and happy reading